Hello, I'm Wendell Leisinger, the Consulting Engineer Segment Manager for Schneider Electric, and also your moderator today. Today's learning objectives. One, to review the codes and standards impacting the selection of media voltage switchgear. Two, learn the pros and cons of power fuses, withdrawable breakers, and stationary breakers. And three, understand how to select the right technology for your installation. Your presenter today is Jeff Jordan. Jeff is our medium voltage solutions expert. He will be discussing the medium voltage power technologies in this webinar. With that, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Wendell. Yes, my name is Jeff Jordan. I am the product offer manager for metal enclosed switch gear with Square D by Schneider Electric in Nashville. If you've ever wondered about your options for code compliant medium voltage technologies, then this 40 minute presentation should help. Medium voltage power distribution technologies have evolved pretty rapidly in the past few years. Traditional switchgear solutions are commonly found along newer ones, more innovative solutions maybe, uh, all together in the same place. Today we're gonna talk about power fuses from the 1960s, withdrawable breakers from the 1980s, and the latest developments in medium voltage technology, the so-called stationary breakers switch gear, which is where I have most of my experience uh, in lab time, spending about half of my time hands-on in the lab in the past five years, leading an R&D team to develop a new stationary switch gear we call HVLCB. In this presentation, we'll review the, the NEC code, your product options for meeting it, uh, their pros and cons, and how to specify them. I think it's best to start this presentation with uh, a review of the IEC and the NEC codes. So let me go here again. Um, in fact, there are a few references, but uh, I think the best way to explain it is that if you ever looked for medium voltage in the NEC, you probably came up short looking for the chapter. In fact, there are a few references, but not like there are for, for low voltage. The ANSI standards for medium voltage are produced by IEEE, and they're intended to regulate the technologies, the electrical technologies, whereas the code produced by NEC really regulates their installations as they relate to selective coordination. So we're going to focus primarily on IEEE today. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, let's get started. Here's a map of the IEEE world of medium voltage switchgear. We're gonna come back to this map a few times during the presentation. So let's go ahead and walk through it. Medium voltage power technologies fit nicely into several categories, uh, some for interrupters and some for their enclosures. Until the 1990s, this worked out pretty well. Then the lines began to blur a little. If you read down the left side of the map, you see the enclosures. On the top is metal clad, MC switch gear defined by C37.20.2. And on the bottom left, you see metal enclosed interrupter switch gear, MEI defined by C37.20.3. If you read across the columns, you see interrupters. C37.40 is for power fuses, and C37.20.4 is for switches. Actually, the name of that standard is switches, 1 kV to 38 kV used in metal enclosed switch gear. That's actually the title, so you can see uh, how, the, how the world was intended to be. The column on the left is for fuses and the related upstream maintenance switches. The column on the right is for circuit breakers. According to IEEE, uh, users have to reference all three of the following standards to properly select their, their breakers, 04 and 0.04, 0.06 and 0.09. Dot 04 is the ratings for circuit breakers, dot 06 is the preferred ratings for circuit breakers, and dot 09 is the qualification test procedure. Okay, so I've said a lot of, I've said IEEE a lot of times, and so I just want to be clear. This, these are IEEE standards adopted by ANSI, uh, and they are primarily where we look in terms of technologies to fit against applications for NEC. So the agenda, a three-part agenda. First, we're gonna start down here in the bottom left with power fuses, that'll be part one. Then we'll move to withdrawable breakers in the upper right box. 
these are the two traditional areas, uh, let's say, of the map where most of the specs are written, written around. Finally, we'll move into what's new, the stationary breakers in the lower right box. Okay, clear enough? Part one, power fuses. Uh, so MV power fuses are the interrupters that complement open air switches in metal enclosed interrupter switch gear. Let's see, one final note about the presentation. We'll be focusing mostly on the application of a transformer primary pictured here uh, on the cover slide too, so that we can compare and contrast the differences. Uh, but just realize that the information here is relevant to many other applications as well. So um, I joked earlier that you might not have found the chapter for medium voltage. Well, uh, this is the chapter. It's actually in the chapter for general, equi general equipment for general use, excuse me, uh, article 450.3 for overcurrent protection. NEC makes a distinction between the two types of overcurrent, uh, and that's short circuit versus thermal overload. So thermal overload is like Clark Griswold's uh, Christmas lights scenario in the famous movie, short circuits, we're talking about lightning strikes, this kind of thing. MV fuses are specified by NEC to be fully compliant for transformer applications. Now, the thing to note about power fuses is that they blow between 250 and 300% of their rated current. This is how they work physically, and this is how the code intends them to be applied. And this differs from the way that other technologies are selected and applied. So let's dig a little deeper. Uh, here's a fuse curve. Uh, it's kind of complex. And a lot of times people uh, dismiss these curves as just uh, too much information uh, presented. So I want to walk through it and make sure it's clear. And we'll come back to the fuse curves with other technologies as well. Uh, but in general, if you look at this thing, which kind of looks like the old psychrometric chart or something from thermodynamics, uh, here I'm highlighting the 40E rated curve. So that's the fuse curve for 40E rated fuse. And you can see in the bottom where 40 amps would fall. And <clears throat> it's important to note that uh, this fuse will take uh, 300 to 600 seconds to burn out. In other words, minutes to clear uh, the overcurrent. And it's very different from the way that LV fuses are used. For example, my grandfather's house when I was growing up, I recall his fuses in the, in the panel. And of course, if you had a, a 20 amp fuse, I expected it to burn out at 20 amps or maybe 22. Uh, in this case, with medium voltage fuses, that's just not the case. Uh, they, are, they are meant to operate differently. And of course, the bigger the short, the faster it blows. So if we look at this curve, you can see that the curve actually shows, I was just talking to somebody briefly uh, earlier today about this, that uh, the curve has a range of, of operating conditions based on the amount of current that it sees. And of course, the faster, the bigger it is, the faster it blows. So uh, we move into the pros and cons. Uh, so here's the situation. There is a portion of the graph here that, that there's no protection. So we talked about the NEC distinguishes between the two types of overcurrent. And in fact, fuses are really intended for short circuit protection, no overload protection. The pros are that they're super fast in the event of a big a short circuit strike. And of course, they are the lowest installed, installed cost. A lot of uh, our clients really love this stuff because uh, of the price and the value. Uh, and they're, they're primarily intended for transformers and always have been. Uh, the cons are that because it's a one-time use fuse, of course, you have to keep spares. And although the fuse doesn't need the maintenance, we uh, have annual maintenance on this kind of switchgear, looking primarily for uh, insulation uh, issues inside the box. Uh, but most importantly, of course, no, no overload. That's the, that's the con. Uh, this particular technology just doesn't handle thermal overload. So let's take an example. Here I'm pointing to that 40E rated fuse. 
So for example, if uh, 150 amps is seen on that circuit, that corresponds to three seconds. Okay, so 40 e rated fuse interrupts 150 amps in three seconds, which is an eternity uh, in, in certain applications. In fact, if we think about incident energy, uh, two seconds is considered the maximum for most studies. So even a correctly sized fuse uh, can be pretty slow to burn. And the time, of course, uh, is, is a major component of the incident energy, which is a function of short circuit time and the, dis the working distance from the event. That may be okay on the primary side of the transformer, but the question is what about the secondary? And more and more often, this is an issue we're beginning to uh, hear from the field, that we want to handle PPE uh, differently, and we're worried about that secondary side. Of course, the same time affects both sides of the transformer. So what does this mean for your application? Take a closer look. Uh, Sorry, so HVL, HVL uh, is one of our most successful medium voltage products with the installation in the US since the 1960s. And as a result, we have a pretty large industrial base, 50 years. If you're interested in specifying HVL, I would recommend specifying the live line indicators, which tell you uh, that each phase is hot, working, and the 50 year install base, both of which are unique to our product. Part two, so part two is basically the same format as part one. We're gonna review the map, NEC, pros and cons, and limitations. But we're now we're moving into metal clad and uh, a much higher degree of, let's say, regulation, enclosure regulation, uh, specifically down to the sheet metal in some cases. Okay, so this category uh, is the category in which the breakers live, traditionally anyway. And what I want to point out is that in this category, there's a very specific requirement for compartmentalization, uh, five compartments. For example, the breaker has its own compartment and the busing its own compartment. This is distinctly different from metal enclosed interrupters, which basically have no requirement for compartmentalization. Uh, you can add it, but it's not required. Okay, so metal clad, MC, breaker. Back to the NEC code, uh, in the same chapter and verse, we have, we have a, a very similar diagram for breakers. And just like power fuses, uh, the breakers are specified, but they offer more control and more options, more set point options. So uh, the situation here is that when we're uh, Considering breakers, really, we have the opportunity to think about how we want to trip, when we want to trip, and uh, you know the, the system is much more, let's say, complex. I say programmable, but I should probably take a caveat. The breaker is really just a spring system; it doesn't uh, isn't naturally programmable by itself, but it includes sensors and relays in the system. And so we say the breaker is programmable, but really, I'm talking about the system. The great benefit to breakers is that they address this limitation of the fuses in the overload protection area. So we've turned our red area to green. I think the first thing I want to do on this graph is point to the horizontal line where it says three cycle trip, 50 milliseconds. In a breaker system, of course, we want to try to compare this to the fuses. And in a breaker system, uh, the breaker itself, the movement of the breaker happens much faster even than 50 milliseconds, it only takes about half the time. But the system includes the sensors, uh, the relays, the latency of the, of the relay program, and the breaker itself. So all of that uh, system happens, um, actuates in 50 milliseconds, including the latency of the reading of the, of the relay. This is important because uh, we're gonna talk about this again later, but mostly because we can compare the speed of tripping here against the speed of tripping in a fuse. And you can see that uh, regardless of the amperage, we always ship at 50 milliseconds. That's totally dependent on a set point 
in the relay how you want it to, uh, at, what, at what amperage you want it to trip. Uh, controllable, of course we talked about that and I'm going to show you in just a second where we control it. Uh, the, the, the cons here though are that the consequence of uh, metal clad switchgear using the withdrawable breakers is that they're uh, fairly large. And the structure uh, is very well defined in the standards. And uh, that means that all of our manufacturers have fairly similar uh, solutions. There are only a few differentiators. And of course, we still have this issue of the annual maintenance. In fact, because of the uh, shape and size of the interrupter uh, connections, finger clusters, we call them, uh, we have to watch out for uh, issues in that region. Back to the controls, if I take a, a second to look at this diagram a little more closely, the sensors watching the primary go to the relay. Uh, SAPAM is the relay we use at Schneider Electric. It's our family of products. One million installed since the 1980s. And uh, most significantly, there's a, a certain high degree of reliability with this product. It is uh, SIL2 certified, and that's hard to find. So I'm uh, very proud of this, and uh, our standard one is the SAPAM 40 which uh, handles what's called ANSI 51, uh, 5051 overcurrent relay protection. And into the enclosure, uh, I want to show you in the circled area of the withdrawable breaker. You can see the region in yellow is the space reservation where that breaker will be uh, withdrawn into, we say racked. So in the racked out position, you can see that the breaker moves even while the door is still closed to the enclosure. And this was the technology of the 80s allowing us to use this new breaker uh, for, for interruption protection. Uh, the trouble is that the, the standard actually specifies the rails, uh, the shutters, everything is, is uh, predefined. And the shutters are interesting. They block the uh, primary, primary conductors when the breaker is in the rack, racked out position. So trouble is uh, they're awfully large, and uh, there's really very little manufacturers can do about that size uh, given the fact that it's required to have the space so that the racked out breaker is, is in the safe position before we can uh, open the door, uh, so-called safe. Okay, so if we want to specify uh, master clad, what I would recommend is that we take a hard look at that relay and make sure that we have high reliability in our relay. Uh, State PAM SIL2 uh, would be a nice way to specify it. Of course, this has been around since, since the 1980s, and so we have an installed base of 30 years. But most importantly, in terms of master clad, uh, we have machined extruded rails in this product. Uh, that's for the racking, and what it means is some of the manufacturers have a little trouble with binding, and as the breaker is being racked in or racked out, the wheels can kind of catch, making it difficult to travel. Uh, these particular rails in, in master clad are smooth, and uh, uh, the channels are shaped exactly for the wheels so that it doesn't bind. It just racks out better. Wendell, you have any questions on, on uh, master clad? That's the end of part two. Yes, there are a number of questions. Um, there's a question from the HVL conversation that you were having. Does the live line indicators require PTs? No, the uh, live line indicators are actually an electronic version of the old uh, mechanical system that was allowed, uh, which was called fuse logic. And fuse logic told you that one of the fuses was burned out. In this case, we have a special uh, capacitor that indicates directly that the line is, is hotter or not. No need for a PT. Great, good to know. In regards to circuit breakers, what type of annual maintenance is necessary for a medium voltage withdrawable breaker? Uh, so that's a great question. We're gonna get into that in a little bit of detail, but I'll tell you that uh, every manufacturer has a requirement for maintenance in their instruction bulletins. And these maintenance procedures generally come from the testing uh, that I was referring to earlier 
in the standard called C37.09. Specifically, mechanical endurance is uh, one of the tests that will drive us to maintenance. So actually, since you have the question, I'll go ahead and, and tell you anecdotally, uh, when a manufacturer is trying to qualify the breaker, uh, and uh, for example, if they want to have UL oversight, and uh, as we do, and have a UL witness listed product, um, the breaker is tested per the standard to some number of operations. But it's interesting that the standard actually specifies maintenance can be performed. So let's say you want to take the breaker to 10,000 operations. If halfway through a fastener falls off, what do you think the engineer does? He takes a look at it, he puts it back in, tightens it up, paints some more grease maybe on the mechanism, calls it maintenance and says, yeah, we have to have some maintenance uh, during the life of the product. And that goes in the instruction bulletin. So for sure we have these things they are specific to the manufacturer. And we're going to get back into that in a minute because that's one of the benefits of stationary breakers. Some of these new products are being tested to a different, uh, let's say, criteria so that no grease is needed and that the fasteners stay tight. Great. Thank you, Jeff. With that, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Well, we're going to move into part three then. Again, the same sort of format. Here's our map. Just to review, we talked about uh, fuses and the metal and closed switch gear in part one in the bottom left. That's HBL. We talked about breakers and metal clad switch gear in part two, and that's master clad. Now I want to tell you about uh, the new generation of switch gear, as we're calling it, this idea of a stationary breaker. And there's a lot of misnomers about it because of the word stationary. It sounds like, sounds like it's stuck. And uh, a lot of concerns about, well, if it's stationary, how do we uh, interrupt the current to do maintenance? So let's, let's dive right in and talk about it. All right, so back to the NEC code. Uh, no change here, exactly the same as uh, for withdrawable breakers, right? The code just specifies that we might want to have protection on our transformer and, uh, and what exactly those ratings are. But it's significant that you should know that the breaker for uh, fixed breakers or stationary breakers is qualified by the exact same standard as for withdrawable breakers. So again, it's programmable. Again, it's a spring system, uh, uh, no, no onboard brain, and we need to relay to tell it when to actuate. So, uh, what is the benefit? Yep, we still have the same short circuit protection and the same overload protection. Uh, yeah, it's it's a small, and so that's that's an added benefit. We no longer if we do the job of design right, we no longer have to have the space reservation for uh, racking it out. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I want to draw your attention to the last two bullets on the pros. 10,000 operations and 10-year maintenance. So back to the story. Uh, for sure, it's a great benefit if you don't need to add grease. Let me explain uh, an anecdotal problem we have experienced from time to time uh, when people, uh, with customer service when people call us at the factory. It, it can occur that someone decides to do a good thing and it turns out bad, where they open up and during a maintenance activity add grease to an already greased breaker, uh, which always sounds like a good idea. However, maybe they use the wrong grease or a different grease, let's say. So you see white grease and you paint red grease because what difference could it possibly make? We're just adding grease. But if that grease reacts, which can occur, there may be the possibility of actually seizing the breaker or slowing the operation. And the speed of interruption inside the vacuum bottle is critical to the interruption itself. So we don't want to mix grease. And ideally, we don't even want to add grease. So the nice thing about this particular breaker shown here, Evelis, which is part of the HVLCB family, uh, is that you don't need to add any grease. And that helps us take us to, toward, uh, toward this extended maintenance uh, environment. Now, what else do we have to handle? Uh, those fasteners can't come loose. Of course, I'm talking about fasteners on the breaker and also fasteners throughout the, uh, the hardware throughout the system that's holding the bus together. But today we have satellites going into space taking rocket rides. And so it's important to note that some manufacturers and 
uh, Schneider Electric included, offer vibration, vibration resistant hardware. Uh, and that's really interesting. Uh, some IEEE papers coming along soon. But basically, these fasteners stay tight uh, even through uh, temperature, temperature fluctuations and uh, thermal expansion, which is wonderful. And these are very inexpensive fasteners. You're not paying for it. Uh, just, simply, just simply something that's come along in the past 20 years uh, since the development of the withdrawable breakers. So this vibration-resistant hardware is included uh, in stationary in at least some of the uh, stationary offers, certainly ours. Uh, lastly, those fingers themselves have sharp pieces. Of course, they're required. You have to have a finger cluster on withdrawable breakers in order to allow the blind insertion and extraction of a breaker with the doors closed. Unfortunately, because they're sharp, we have to monitor that area for partial discharge. And over time, it's possible that the discharges will actually eat into the insulation and can potentially cause a problem. There is no standard today that, that captures this, uh, this measurement in the ANSI world, but the CSA standard does, and it's being slowly adopted and, and will be in the new standard for metal enclosed when it comes out probably later this year. The measurement is 20 picocoulombs. Uh, we want to try to stay under 20 picocoulombs. And the Evolus breaker system in HVLCB is actually four times under the maximum discharge level, which is to say it's at... Uh, about four picocoulombs discharge. All of this has been tested and listed by UL to give you some confidence in what I'm saying. So basically, uh, what I can tell you about this product, HVLCB, is that it brings the best of both worlds. We've got the breaker technology that gives us the benefits we've already been through, and in addition, a maintenance disconnect switch above it, no load, Right? It's not taking the load. All of the interruption is always at the breaker, but allows us to disconnect the entire breaker compartment and, if the option is chosen, ground the entire breaker compartment before opening the door. So let me take you kind of through a, an example here. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a great improvement over the racked out position of traditional MV breaker switch gear. Uh, here, for example, is a lineup of feeders, HVLCB feeders. 52 is the ANSI designation for the breaker, and if you look above, you'll see the circle is our disconnect. And the disconnect is part of the comp compartmentalization in this gear. Again, it's not required for metal and closed switch gear, but we've added it because, of course, it's, it's desirable. If we look at the green bar, you'll see that that is uh, moving into an open position. At the moment that the disconnect is in the open position, that means now that the entire breaking compartment is de-energized, which is totally different from uh, the way that um, the way that uh, maintenance is performed in, in metal clad withdrawable switchgear. So, HVLCB. Here's a look at the insides. We won't go too deep into the anatomy, although we can uh, in a follow-on 101 presentation if needed, but I want to show you this slide primarily to explain that uh, it hits more or less where the survey was asking, uh, which was fantastic and beautiful, Wendell. Thank you very much. Just as expected, we have a product here that's sort of threading the needle. It handles 15 k, up to 15 kV and up to 1,200 amps, uh, 25 kA short circuit rating. Just where most of you on the phone today are uh, expecting to see clients asking for switchgear. If you want more than that, we have other products. And of course, if your clients are cost conscious, maybe we want to look at fuses. But in general, this is a pretty neat product for most, for most of the market, what we call the medium portion of the market. Okay. So how would we specify this product? Well, uh, I see there's a couple of errors on here, but in general, it's the same CPAM relay, and so remember the picture from, from before. And uh, that's the same uh, SIL2 uh, reliability rating as before. It's, in fact, the same relay. What's important is that now we're moving into stationary but rail-mounted breakers. So I didn't point it out, but the breaker that's stationary actually has little wheels on it for maintenance activity only. 
And so after bolts are removed from the primary circuit, the breaker can fairly easily be rolled out uh, and another one rolled back in. The same solution exists for the VT CPT truck. So this product has an onboard CPT control power transformer for just in case we want to generate power from the primary circuit. And 10 years between maintenance intervals is a big deal. As I mentioned before in the other products, uh, we always recommend annual maintenance almost throughout the industry on most products, certainly uh, our, our legacy products. But here we're moving into a position where we can offer you 10 years uh, in between maintenance activities for extra uptime and flexibility. Okay. So the big takeaway now, we've, we've been through the three parts. Uh, here's, here's the mental image I want to leave in your mind. Uh, we talked about power fuses in the bottom left, and we talked about withdrawable breakers in the top right, and the new stationary breakers in the bottom right quadrant. Um, so how do you select the right technology for your installation? Yeah, well, of course, it depends. But if we take this map of the world and transpose on top of it maybe a, an image of uh, dollars and automation, so on the left side, we're talking about the most basic protection. And on the right side, automation and intelligent uh, operation. At the bottom is uh, the least expensive options, and at the top is most expensive options. Then basically, HVL, it falls right here. Again, designed in the 60s, uh, NEC code compliant, basically inexpensive, but uh, basic protection. Uh, Bulletproof, works every time, uh, very popular in the industry even today. At the end of, other end of the spectrum, at the other end of the spectrum is MasterClad. MasterClad is big and uh, even has a big low voltage control compartment. And so as a result, we have all sorts of customization options here. Uh, also higher ratings are available. And so you can imagine uh, lots of clients, of course most of the industry has settled around specifications for these two ends of the spectrum. And so HVLCB falls in between. I would put it right about here. Pretty heavy on the automation and intelligence uh, aspect, but smaller, and so also limited in some of its uh, ratings, but generally more or less right where the market wants to be most of the time. And fairly inexpensive, I would say, in between MasterCloud and HVL for you. We have other products, and so I just want to sort of draw a curve for you and show you uh, how all of these things fall out. The positions may not be exactly right, but in general we have other power fuse uh, options which are a little bit more intelligent. And of course the new Prem set, which is a stationary breaker in the same family as HVLCB. So we have options to suit your needs. And with that, Wendell, uh, I'm concluding my presentation. I'd like to have any other questions the audience may have. You have a lot of questions. It'll keep you busy this weekend. So <laughs> you've covered this a little bit, Jeff, but uh, the question, there's a couple of questions around this. Uh, will the MV stationary breakers follow the standards for metal clad? That is with independent compartments, no exposed live parts. When maintaining the medium voltage stationary breaker, are there draw out as well as similar to the conventional draw out. So you've talked to the second part a little bit, but if you just go through that again so that everybody's clear. Yeah. Okay, so uh, number one, I, I think the most important aspect here of is it the same is that it, it is uh, conforming to the exact same test standard, which is to say that uh, we go to a high power, power, high power test lab and walk through the test duties, uh, one through I think it's uh, 13 and one through 11, I can't remember. I know number test duty four and test duty seven are the big ones. And uh, in fact, those are the exact same test standards that we use for any withdrawable gear. So yes, the same insulation is required. The same vacuum bottles are required. The same performance of the vacuum bottles is required and the same battery of tests is performed. Now the second part of the question is what about, uh, uh, what about the, this idea of withdrawable? So withdrawable is the language of master clad, of, of metal clad switchgear. 
Uh, in the standard, it says it have to, has to be withdrawable. So we don't use that word anymore when we're talking about the breaker in metal enclosed. So these stationary breakers, uh, some of which are fixed and permanent, and some of which can be removed, uh, if we're going to remove it, we don't call it withdrawable at that point. We have to call it removable just to keep us clean on uh, the standards. But yes, HVLCB, for example, has, uh, is rail-mounted and pinned in position. So if I can try to walk you through the anatomy, there are three primary conductors, one, two, three, three load conductors, one, two, three. So that's a total of six bolts holding it in position, plus two more anchoring uh, the switch gear into the sides of the gear for a total of eight bolts holding it in, into position. Uh, and it's interesting because the last two bolts really tie into rails. And the breaker is otherwise sitting on wheels. So when the moment comes that we want to do the maintenance, uh, loosen eight bolts and roll the breaker out. That's it. Great. Mendel? Yes, very good. A number of questions are coming in. Um, are fixed switch gear available in double high? Or how many breakers can you get in the draw um, as compared to draw out in the same footprint? Um, so it's actually those are those are very interesting questions and if I can take them together, um, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> the too high is not is not offered. So far we have a, uh, we have no offer that is too high. On the other hand, um, we are able to get two breakers in 48 inches, which is, uh, I think, really the request. So the footprint, on the footprint, in terms of a system, we, we certainly have the, uh, the advantage. Uh, each breaker system is 24 inches wide. But in terms of too high, no, because of the way that we have designed the system for increased reliability uh, and maintenance, we have a disconnect in the position where, uh, where you might expect a breaker to be. And we has a, have a reservation on the floor where a VT truck uh, can always go. Great. Another question. Does the entire lineup of the HVLCB switch gear have to be de-energized prior to disconnecting a single breaker compartment? Right. So this is always a point of confusion, and the answer is no. Uh, each and every single one of these uh, sections has its own disconnect. And if you look now, I'm trying to, I'm pointing. I wish I had something to point with. But at the red, at the top, let's say uh, one third down from the top, the red area where the boots are showing connected to the top of the disconnect, that's the main bus. And so you can imagine a main bus passing through several different feeders. In fact, we can connect HVLCB and HVLCC feeders together in a lineup, each one with its own disconnect. Great. There's a number of questions around our class incident energy. Um, try this one. Discuss whether HVLCB has barriers to prevent arc flash plasma from spreading throughout the gear. Ah. So uh, in the event of an arc incident, uh, the gear is destroyed. And so each section uh, being separated from each other, is uh, there is a category called arc resistance type 2C. HVLCB is, is certified to arc resistant type 2B, and so it does not allow differentiation between the sections. Okay, this is really arc containment gear. And so if, if, uh, if arc resistance is a, uh, is a concern, we really should do that with controls and not with uh, switch gear, at least in my opinion. We also have other switch gear, some of which is arc rated and some of which is not. So lots of options, and it depends entirely upon the product. Here's a question you'll like to talk about, Jeff. And that is, can you talk about the accessibility front only or front and back pros and cons of HVLCB? Oh yeah, so that's great. The, uh, the image here shown of an HVLCB is actually a floor uh, cable in a solution, right? So we see the cable, the, the barrier at the rear of the gear is separating a, a uh, cable compartment. And so in this case, this would be one where rear access would be required. But there are many applications of this, of this gear 
where everything can come out the front and the switchgear can be placed right up against the wall. Uh, and so we actually only need uh, one inch of space behind it in most applications. This one being the most dense is a little different. It has a full suite of breakers and VTs and CPTs. But as I said, most applications uh, is certainly not required and front access is allowed. And the way that this is done, basically the any anything on the floor, this VT area, would be removed first. And then the breaker is removed second, exposing the whole interior uh, of the unit, basically one big empty shell. Great. There's a number of questions around fixed versus withdrawable breakers in cost or price. Do you have any guidance there, right. Jeff? Right. So let me go to my little image. I've uh, we really need to probably talk price on a case by case basis, but in general, I can show uh, you this. Whoops. I can need to go through my animations. Yep. So stationary breaker switchgear is priced uh, equivalent to or under master clad uh, metal enclosed prices. Now I say equivalent to or under because basically it depends on the ratings in the application. But uh, metal, metal, I'm sorry, uh, medium voltage switchgear is generally uh, has a market value and so all of this gear is competitive. And uh, I think it just depends on the specific application and the sort of sensors and circuit monitoring that we need for your application. So a bit diplomatic, but yeah, in general, it's equivalent to or under the metal clad uh, equivalent offer. Following along with a little bit more about the products itself, what's the limit of number of CT sets that can be installed in fixed gear? Fixed switch, switch gear, sorry. Yeah. CTs. Let me see if I can find the CTs. CTs. We find an image of a breaker. Uh, this differs, of course, on each product, but specifically related to HVLCB, I can show you this picture, which has uh, four black bricks, let's say, on the back of the breaker. Do you see them? Uh, it depends on whether we've selected standard accuracy or high accuracy, but standard accuracy CTs, we can have up to four of them. Uh, there's one per phase, but we use a common case for all three. So basically, you have three CTs in one case. And we can have up to four uh, of those sets on one, uh, on one breaker module, or 12 CTs in total. And the way we handle that uh, is, is entirely dependent on your application. So we have a full suite starting at 50 to 1, uh, sorry, 50 to 5 amp ratios, all the way up to 1,200 to 5. Here's another question. Can you get a main draw out or stationary breaker with HVL fused feeder bays? Yes, I, I had to understand, make sure I understand the question. Yeah, a lineup we're talking about with a main right. and, uh, and uh, feeders, yes. Now, uh, a transition is required in between, but the main, uh, the main and the feeders are actually, can be identical. And so you can imagine basically the transition bus simply takes the load side of the main up to the main bus side of the feeder. And then a set of feeders, let me show this image again. Yeah, basically a set of feeders can all stack one next to the other, uh, 24 inches, 24 inches, 24 inches, always the same size. And all of the bus here at the top of the brown tank, which is the disconnect, the bus all lines up. By the way, that same bus, as I mentioned before, lines up also to HVLCC. So it's possible to have a single HVLCB main, a transition, which is only 17 inches wide, and then a series of different feeders, HVLCC and HVLCB, depending on if the load is better served with a breaker or a, or a uh, power fuse. Great, good to know. Here's another question. Is the disconnect switch on the top of the HVLCB structure gas insulated? If so, can you monitor gas condition? 
Yes, it is gas insulated. It is uh, an, actually an SF6 uh, container. It's the same SF6 switch that we use as a load break interrupter for HVLCC. And it's interesting because uh, HVLCC is the product that brought that, uh, that disconnect to market. And it's referred to uh, in the standard as the preferred, uh, the preferred rating for a uh, few switches. Uh, and so, yes, uh, it, is, it is a gas, and it, yes, it can be monitored, uh, although that is not an option that we uh, commonly see because the tank is sealed for life uh, at the factory. Great. This, will, this one's going to relate to your testing background, Jeff. Is there a set number of times that the disconnect can be operated under load before it needs repair or replacement? Yeah. So the, um, the disconnect is actually, uh, let's say the life of the disconnect is, is actually dependent on the actual amperage sent to it. Uh, and the reason is that as, as the conductors rotate and the copper ends uh, take some abuse from the operation, uh, you know, of course, it's, it depends entirely on the amperage of that break, uh, you know, uh, to say how much to how much damage occurs or or, or non-damage or or uh, typical action. So uh, we have graphs and charts that demonstrate this, and uh, you can see that the more operations and the higher the amperage, the 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 slower. I'm sorry, the uh, what do I say? Uh, the less shorter. extended the life, shorter. Thank you, shorter the life. Thank you. But in general, at 600 amps, uh, we see something closer to uh, 1,000 operations. So here's a little bit about the um, equipment being shipped. Are the breakers shipped installed in the cabinet on the, sh on the uh, fixed, or are they shipped loose? Okay, that's very interesting. We spent a lot of time on the design team worrying about this problem and so I actually conducted some real world tests with LTL shipments, you know, just to have transportation hubs sort of uh, jostle the switch gear and make sure that everything was in good shape. And so, yeah, I'm happy to say that at least this one product, HVLCB, uh, the breaker is installed and shipped fixed in position, not loose, not separate, in a separate pallet. By the way, uh, we haven't talked much about it in this presentation, but PremSet is in fact permanently mounted, and so it also ships fixed in position and not loose, not separate. Question in regards to more information. Uh, please note that you can download this presentation from your dashboard, but what about more information? Where would they get that, Jeff? Oh, um, so I think, Wendell, you had at the beginning of your presentation the Schneider Electric uh, website, which is schneider-electric.com. We also, when we launch products, we have launch pages, and so I want to direct your attention uh, with regard to HVLCB, uh, which is, I, I'm guessing, where most of the questions are related. Uh, you can go to schneider-electric.us uh, forward slash the letters HVLCB, and you should come to our product page, which includes videos and brochures and uh, uh, very soon a case study. And uh, this sort of information probably goes a long way to explaining uh, the details that I've left out. And of course, don't hesitate to call us. We have a customer care center, and everybody's anxious to hear from you at 888-SQUARE-D. Our time, I see, is run out. Uh, there are a lot of questions. There's a number of questions that are unanswered, even in regards to snubbers and MOVs and other technical um, questions that Jeff will answer. Everyone uh, will will go through these questions and answer all of them and send the answers and questions back to everybody that has participated in this webinar. With that, I will thank everyone for attending. And Jeff, thank you for the insight, the understanding, and the uh, information on our new HVLCB and how the technology is moving forward. And I thank everyone for attending today. Thank you very much for your questions, your insight, and thanks for your interest in Schneider Electric. Have a great day.